Welcome to Midweek First Baptist Family. It'll be good to see each other on Sunday again as we reunite together uh, back in in-person services for church. It'll be great to see everybody be able to worship together, uh, be equipped with the Word together, hear the Gospel together. If you have your Bible, we're going to continue on our study of the book of Exodus. So if you have your Bible, you can turn it to Exodus chapter 3. And we're going to be in the first 15 verses uh, for midweek this week. And we've already been looking at uh, kind of how the Exodus is playing into God's overall redemptive plan for all of humanity to be reconciled to himself. Our greatest need as humans is, always has been, and forever will be God. And the greatest problem in the world is that people are separated from God. And the only solution to that problem is by believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the only thing that's going to change our minds. That's the only thing that's going to change our hearts. That's the only thing that's going to change the world is through faith in Christ. We can be reconciled to God. And so there are many things in Exodus that are pointing to Christ, many ways that God identifies himself that point directly to Christ. So Exodus chapter 3 uh, what's happened here, we've already looked at kind of the history of the people of Israel, why they're important in Exodus 1. and Exodus 2, last week, we saw that Moses was saved from being killed as a baby, being put in a basket, rescued by Pharaoh's daughter, nursed by his own Hebrew mother, then given back to Pharaoh's daughter to be raised under uh, kind of the house of Pharaoh. And so Moses then... Uh, gets himself into some trouble. Uh, he sees a Egyptian uh, person, uh, Egyptian taskmaster is ta I can't say that word. Taskmaster is what they call him here in the Old Testament. He was mistreating a Hebrew slave while they were doing work. Moses kills the Egyptian, tries to cover it up, but finds out that people had seen it happen. People saw and they knew that Moses had murdered uh, the Egyptian leader, the Egyptian taskmaster. And so when he finds that out, he flees to a place called Midian. He marries a woman there and he starts just becoming kind of a shepherd uh, in the area of Midian. So that's where we pick up the narrative. Exodus 3 verse 1 says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him a flame of fire out of the midst of a burning bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. So Moses is kind of going about his everyday routine, tending his flock, and then uh, kind of, you know, very out of the ordinary. This is the only time that God would appear in such a way uh, to someone else. Uh, the angel of the Lord appears in a flame of fire, in a bush. And so this is a very, very uh, popular, well-known story. People use this kind of expression all the time, a, a burning bush experience. This is obviously would have been transformative and life-changing, something Moses would never forget. But it isn't really explained. It really isn't examined. It's just simply stated. There's an angel of the Lord comes in a flame of fire in the burning bush. We're not really sure why exactly all God why he decided to appear to Moses in this way, but he did. And so the angel of the Lord also isn't explained, also isn't necessarily identified. A lot of times uh, there are many scholars who believe that this is a pre-incarnate Jesus, that this is the second person of the Trinity because the angel speaks on behalf of God, but he also speaks as if he is God. And so he could, he could not be, we're not really sure, but that's what most scholars tend to believe. And so there is this fire, but it was a controlled fire. So that's representative of God. He's powerful. He can consume people in judgment. He also can, he also can purify his people through fire, but he's not out of control. This fire was in the bush, yet the bush was not consumed. And so what we're going to see here are two key characteristics of God uh, that we know in theology as God's transcendence and God's imminent. So God is transcendent, meaning he is above and beyond anything else created because he is the infinite creator. But he's also imminent, meaning he's personal, he's relational, and he desires an intimate love relationship with us and with his people as a whole. So as that's happening, verse 3, Moses said, I'll turn aside and see this great sight. 
why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. So what I want us to notice here is that God didn't speak to Moses until he turned aside to look at the bush. Moses could have gone about his everyday routine, uh, could have gone about his busyness and never turned aside to see what this thing was, this angel of the Lord in a burning bush. So once he turns aside, it says that the Lord saw that he turned aside. Then he speaks to Moses and he addresses him as Moses, Moses. And that's on purpose. That occurs a very few times in all of scripture. But anytime someone is addressed by their name twice, it denotes personal relationship. So it's showing that God knew Moses intimately. He knew him personally. Moses, Moses. It appears other times in the Bible, Absalom, Absalom. When people say, Lord, Lord, personal relationship. When Jesus says, oh, Israel, Israel, denoting personal, intimate love relationship. And so a lot of times, though, a sin that we turn a blind eye to, talking about Moses stopping, seeing, turning aside to see the burning bush, a sin that we turn a blind eye to for me in my own heart and in our culture, a very easy one that we don't always identify is the sin of busyness, just being busy. I can't tell you how many times, and I used to make the excuse myself, but I can't tell you how many times I'm talking to a person, asking them if they want to be discipled, if they want to have a discipling relationship, and it's always, well, well, let me check my schedule, or let me see if I have time, or if it fits in, if it works, it's good, and that never ends up happening. Anything that distracts us from God, from hearing from God, and the mission of God, anything that distracts us from God and His mission is sin, because we're not giving our lives over to what's eternal, to what God desires. So Moses turns aside, God addresses him personally, then verse 5 then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. Again, that's something that's not explained. There are people that try to over interpret this, but probably the reason why God asked Moses to take his sandals off is because in ancient Near Eastern culture and still today in Middle Eastern cultures, when anyone's in the presence of a king or an authority, they take off their shoes. That is the common custom uh, that is used when someone was in the presence of a king or authority. It's not a common biblical practice. Uh, we don't see that a whole lot in the Bible, so there's not really a big biblical grounds for it, but God is probably telling Moses that to relate to him in a way that Moses would understand. Take your sandals off your feet, and then he gives the clear reason for the place you're standing is holy ground. So there's nothing inherently holy about the ground. There's nothing inherently holy about the mountain. Nothing is inherently holy just because. What made the ground holy was the presence of God. Anywhere God dwells, his holiness comes with him. And so he tells him, take your shoes off your feet, probably because you're in the presence of the king. You're in the presence of the ultimate authority. The place on your standing is holy ground because God is holy. So verse 6, God continues. He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So God will identify himself in this way over and over and over again in the book of Exodus. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He uses it three times here just in this chapter. Just in chapter 3, God identifies himself in that way because he's reminding his people of his original promise that he'd given to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And the promise was this, that he would bless them, that he would make their descendants as numerous as the sand on the seashore, numerous as the stars in the sky, numerous as the dust of the earth, that he would bless them and multiply their offspring, and that through their offspring, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. This is extremely significant in the biblical narrative, because when we get to the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1, we see that Jesus is the ultimate offspring of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And through him, remember, through their offspring, which is Christ, it finds its fulfillment in Christ, that through Christ, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Anyone from anywhere can be saved by believing in the gospel of Christ. He is the ultimate offspring 
who fulfills the promise given to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So God is reminding his people of his promises and his faithfulness in the past. And he's also looking forward to the savior of the world, to the ultimate offspring who is Christ. And God will be faithful to use us, his church, his people to reach the world with the gospel. And God doesn't just want to use us. God wants to be with us. His desire is to dwell among his people and he cares for his people. Verse seven, then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And so God chooses Moses to deliver the people of Israel out of Egypt. Verse 11, Moses replies, Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And that isn't the wrong question to ask. That's the right question. Who am I? Why am I so special? Why are you choosing me? And the answer that's implied to Moses is that Moses, you're nobody. And that is exactly why he qualifies for the job. If we're paying attention, we see that it took 40 years to make him a nobody because 40 years ago, Moses was a somebody. He was living under the house of Pharaoh. He had favor with the Egyptians. He had all the prosperity. He had all the wealth. He had everything going for him. It took 40 years to turn Moses into a nobody. 40 years ago, he was living like a king. This is exactly what the American dream and everything else in our culture tells us to pursue, tells us to pursue comfort entertainment, amusement, to work hard so that you can fulfill yourself. Just like Moses was 40 years ago, had everything going for him, very successful from a worldly standpoint. The American dream says, be somebody, make something of yourself. Meanwhile, Jesus says in Luke 9, deny yourself. That is the first requirement to be his disciple. So when we spend all this time and money trying to make us somebody, when God only uses the nobodies, because here's the point. Moses is not the deliverer of the people of Israel. God is, and he wants to make that very clear. He responds in verse 12. He said, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought this people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Very, very reminiscent of when Jesus gives the great commission to his disciples in Matthew 28. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. You can almost see Peter like at that point pipe up, but, but, and, and Jesus is saying, and surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus didn't even give his disciples a chance to interject. He said the same thing to his disciples that God is saying here. I'm sending you on my mission and I will be with you. So God dwelling among his people. That's the only way the mission to reach the world with the gospel is going to happen, is going to be brought about. So then verse 13, Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. So I want to catch this. That's not the name. God hasn't gotten to the name yet. God wants Moses to know who he is first. He wants him to know his being. So he says, I am who I am. So I don't want us to get it twisted or confused here. But in the sense that we say that God exists, God technically, theologically doesn't exist in the sense that we commonly use it. Because to exist means to grow, it means to learn, it means to improve, it means to change, to get better. We do all those things. We as humans exist. We grow, we change, we improve, we learn, we get better. God does none of that. God doesn't change. God doesn't improve. God doesn't get better over time. God doesn't learn anything new. So God doesn't exist. 
God is. He is who he is. That's why he says, I am who I am. He doesn't exist in the way that we use it because he is eternal. Doesn't change. Doesn't learn. Doesn't improve. Doesn't get better. He just is. He is who he is. So God first wants Moses to understand who he is, his being. Then he said, he said, say to this people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Common identification Jesus would use for himself, the I am statements. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord. So that's his name. The God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. There it is again, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. And so when God says that his name is the Lord, in our English translations, if, you, if we pay attention, that is distinct from other times that we see Lord. In our English translations, it is translated capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And that is the name Yahweh in Hebrew. That is the name of the Lord. So God here gives himself a personal name like CJ or Kevin or Ron. So God is his title, but the Lord Yahweh is his name. So in other places where we see Lord, capital L, lowercase o, lowercase r, lowercase d, that just means a person that had authority. That's why it wasn't sinful when we go in the Old Testament and where we see humans called Lord. It wasn't sinful to call a human Lord because that just meant that they were the authoritative person at that time. So here, there we, I could go so much more in depth of what God is telling Moses here, but we will have to cut it off right there. I want to present the gospel. Uh, like I said, every week I always want to present the gospel, and the gospel is this, this same God that has revealed himself to Moses. We've already seen that he is holy. Our problem as humans is that we are not. We are not holy. Therefore, we are unfit for the kingdom of God. We have all sinned and turned against God, and the punishment for our sin is an eternity separated from him in hell. And God is just, God is righteous. He has to give the sinner the punishment that we deserve for our sin. And so, because we are in a position where there's no way for us to earn any type of salvation, we can't earn being right with God by becoming more moral or more religious or doing good things because none of those things negate the fact that we have sinned against God and that our punishment, our condemnation is in hell forever. So because there's nothing that we could do, God acted on our behalf. God sent his son, Jesus. Jesus lived a perfectly sinless life on our behalf, a life where he perfectly loved God, perfectly loved people, therefore he never sinned. Then Jesus died on the cross to pay the death penalty of hell that we rightly deserve. So that God could be both just and Savior at the same time. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and he rose again three days later showing that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. So that anyone who turns from their sin and their self, places their faith in Christ, will be completely forgiven of their sins forever and saved for all of eternity. We get to have eternal life in Christ. And so the response to that gospel message is to repent from your sins, deny yourself, and believe only in Christ for your salvation. And when you do, God will completely change your life and give you a new one in which you are sent on mission to proclaim that message of the gospel and make disciples. Thank you guys for watching. See you next week.